Good day, everyone. It is 5.54 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on November the 28th, 2017, they say. This is the second installment, although it probably should be called Fiat Language 1, since the preceding video I made in this series really ought to be the introduction, and each one of these videos should probably coincide to a specific character in the order that they appear in the Hebrew alphabet or alphabet, whichever you want to call it, because uh, as you're going to see, the two are far more closely related than you may have ever thought. I have made the claim in the past, and I will continue to make this claim because I am able to prove it, that English is the most Shemitic, not Semitic, Shemitic living language there is. And I believe that there is many reasons for that. One reason, of course, is by way of identification of the uh, living descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob after the flesh. So that the ultimate plan of Yahweh, the God of Israel, will be realized in the earth. I want to quickly make a statement concerning the studies that I'm currently doing and many of the statements that I make concerning current events, uh, peoples, who are doing what to what peoples and for what reason. As I shared with a friend this morning by email concerning the descendants of Israel and what their purpose and intent and place is to be in the world and among all the nations of the world, as Yahweh, the great, only, true, living God, has planned, purposed, and intended it, and has shown us in his word, historically, that he has purposed for Israel to be a blessing unto the nations, and that he would do a certain specific special work through them. This in no way makes them better or above any other people because anyone can see just from their daily readings throughout the so-called Old Testament that Israel's behavior has been classically of the worst kind. But our great God Yahweh, which probably should be more correctly pronounced Yahweh, Yahweh. The Yah probably isn't so accurate, but his great plan will be realized. Those of us who understand who the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are after the flesh, who have the spirit of our great God's only born son, Yahshua, in us, would know and understand that the purpose that we would serve would be to be a blessing to the other nations by way of being useful to our God in transmitting all of his truth to all peoples. Because if we don't do that as service to him and our Lord Yahshua and all those peoples that he wishes to hear his truth and understand, then we're not of much use 
those who glorify in their flesh, those who are absurdly arrogant, do not know their history, whether they be uh, of the <clears throat> modern people who claim to be Jews, or the house of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, or whether they be uh, those various souls who believe in this idea of the black Israelites, or whether they be the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Caucasian people who know by language, history, region, location, and many other factors that they are the descendants of the patriarchs of Scripture. Either way, no matter who you are, and why you believe you would be the descendants of the patriarchs. You are out of your mind if you simply glory in your own flesh, believing yourself to be better than anyone else in and of yourself. With that being said, I want to further tell everyone that this series I'm doing is not intended to make me out to be your teacher. I am here to share what information has been given to me. It's not yet complete. Some parts of it may yet still be inaccurate by way of an incomplete understanding. I'm still working, but I am sharing this because I fully believe that we must act together as a body to freely share information and um, more than anything else, what you can do for me and for the sake of the truth of the scriptures, of our God being known, pray for me. Just pray for me. Uh, he, our God has already given me a great passion to do these things, but I am a very little man up against a very large predicament <laughs> project. So please do that, and I appreciate it tremendously. What I have on the screen, which will serve as my basic template as we go along through the Hebrew alphabet or alphabet is six characters that are representing a great span of time as we know it. The character to the far left would represent the earliest and the character to the far right would represent the latest. And I have them listed. These presentations will be extremely visual, but they will also be uh, very verbal. I will try to be as descriptive as possible as I go through these things. And as I said in the introduction to fiat language, as this is part of the series of fiat language, I'm going to rely on those of you who take the time to listen to this and to understand what the issues are currently with the text, with the lexicons and concordances and the, uh, the understanding of the day when it comes to the Hebrew scriptures. I could use your help. So, I will give you all information that I know of, that I can, that I can think of, and I do pray before every one of these videos that 
The Father's will will be done, and I really hope that you're blessed and that you can take this information, uh, glean all you can from it, and share it with others. Give back to others. Now, the Bible says to buy the truth and don't sell it. Now, I'm not even selling it, so you don't have to buy it, but you could look a little deeper than that and basically uh, overlay that with a number of the parables that Yahshua told concerning the kingdom and the value thereof. Give everything that you have of value to attain this information with the end result being to ultimately know and understand the truth, the God who wrote this, his plan of salvation, his Messiah, and everything. And then, as you gain understanding, give that away freely. Those who charge for the truth, I fear, don't really have a love and sincere appreciation for the truth. Now, as you will see, there are listed six different types of script, if you want to call it script. Although, I believe that up until a point, all of these things were not necessarily script, but were iconic. They all have inherent meaning, and they all originally had inherent meaning to each one of the characters or icons or symbols, those put together in a certain way to give a full and complete meaning to any given word and thus thought. This character is commonly today called Aleph. I don't call it Aleph. Many of these characters I typically refer to by their modern English counterparts because, as you'll see, they all invariably have a modern English counterpart. Now, you'll find towards the end of the ancient Hebrew alphabet that some of the characters have a, a characteristic to them where they are sort of a combination of other sounds made with other characters. And those would be the letters that are a little less clear as far as just having modern-day simple clear equivalents. And we'll get into that. And by the time we get into that, which will be towards the end of the alphabet, you will definitely see how it is that the overwhelming evidence points to uh, great equivalence between the ancient character and the modern English letter. And now, as you can see, there are six characters, all labeled from, at the left, ancient Hebrew slash proto-proto-Sinaitic. The next is Shemitic Middle, not Semitic, Shemitic Middle. The next is Phoenician slash Moabite. The next, Shemitic Late. The next, Modern Jewish, not Hebrew, Modern Jewish. And the last, Modern English. You'll notice that from the earliest character to the most modern character, the great similarities. You'll notice it especially when you get into the middle 
texts. How much resemblance there is from the early to our modern English. There are many charts available online to look at the development of the Hebrew language throughout the various times in the history of the Hebrews, all the way up to their various predecessors from the early travels um, and exits of various peoples of various tribes of Israel, and them then turning up later in the form of languages such as Etruscan, Early Greek. You should definitely look at the Early Greek before it became more stylized, and that's one of the greatest disservices that is done to any of these languages, the stylization, the calligraphic looking character that seems to be definitely post-Babylonian. Now, there's a lot of things that are post-Babylonian that I'm not necessarily in love with. But you will definitely see, as you chart languages from the earliest known Hebrew to the most modern English, and then go back to, say, languages such as Latin and Greek, you're going to see the progression of these characters throughout time. Now, I admit, I've often wondered where it was exactly that these characters lost their inherent meanings. I don't yet have the answers to that. The only answers that I do have is the meanings of the characters today are given fully in every possible source that we have in mainstream academia, which of course trickles down to us goy. It is all given to us by pure fiat. We are not given true meaningful understandings. Because, after all, if we were, then we would understand. So, as I said earlier, I will not give the meanings that are given at most websites, most sources, and most quote-unquote teachers who offer the meanings of these characters. The reason for that is because the few people that are now specializing in the ancient Hebrew character and its inherent meaning are either invariably gatekeepers or they are just taking their information from the gatekeepers and regurgitating it back to you. I will, however, tell you what I believe I'm seeing in the characters that I have examined thus far, and will very humbly ask for the opinion of anyone else as to if they're seeing something else. Now, based on the theory that all of these characters do have an inherent meaning that lies within themselves, so that someone else can't come along and say, that means whatever we say it means, I would have to, I would have to just conclude that all of the characters in the ancient Hebrew alphabet were representative of something that would have been common to pretty much everyone, so that these were not characters of things that were foreign or hidden or obscure but should be common. Now, keep in mind that when gatekeepers give out information, 
Uh, typically, not only do they charge for it in some way, or else beg for donations, of course, of course. They also have to, in order to be a successful gatekeeper, they have to give you at least a certain amount of truth. So, I fully believe that some of the meanings of some of the characters that they've offered are, in fact, either absolutely correct or correct enough to keep up their con. Now, without saying which I think he is, I would tell you that if you have, say, eSword, you can download um, an add-on software for eSword, which is the ancient Hebrew, um, it's called the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible. This is said to have been written entirely by one man, Jeff Benner. Jeff Benner also maintains the website, uh, the Ancient Hebrew Learning Center, and is said to have authored many, many books. And I gotta tell you, after you look at this massive amount of material that it is believed that he has authored single-handedly, um, he's either Superman or he did not author it single-handedly, but he is simply the front man for a gatekeeping operation. I'm not sure which it is, because there are a number of various teachings he offers throughout a lot of his videos and on his website, which of course make absolute utter sense. In fact, some of them are so insightful that it's ridiculous. And so it leaves one scratching their head and just wondering how. Because, like I said, he's either Superman and very irresponsible with the definitions that he's giving for these characters, or this idea that he alone has authored all of these things is absolutely, utterly, utterly false. You'll see in the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, we can select any word and most of all of the readings that I'm going to give you in this series are going to be from King James. Not because it's my favorite, it's not. But because most of the uh, more exhaustive and complete concordances and even lexicons, Bible dictionaries, topical Bibles, everything, refer back to King James as their standard. So I'm going to have to, for the purposes of being consistent, continually refer to the King James. Um, the issue that you're going to see as you spend some serious time in this ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible is that, as I said, you're going to find a number of characters to seem to be very accurate in their definition. But as you go, you'll find that many, many, many others are not. And really, honestly, how many characters in a 22-character alphabet do you have to fudge to make sure that everybody still doesn't really understand the language or what's being expressed? Half? I mean, you know, if you stick with a, a basic regimen of certain words and word types and provide extremely sound definitions for those things and insights, then I think you could probably fudge a whole lot more than just half the characters. 
So with the Aleph, or as I call it, it's the modern A ah or A, I don't see it as ever really making a hard A sound. Remember, A is the name of a letter, A. But more often than not, it tends to make an A ah sound. I know sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short, and and it it varies greatly in the English language. And of course, once you take Hebrew and add the Masoretes Nikudot to it, well, then it varies greatly again. Remember, they have about three or four different Nikud for every single vowel sound that there is. And honestly. Even purporting that there was a language created by our great God to be the foundational language of all knowledge we would have about him and his creation and his plan that wouldn't even have any vowels, so that it had to be left up to certain specific people to buy their traditions. And remember, the Masoretes are nothing more than the ans or predecessors, successors of the rabbis who were, uh, by way of their tradition, making the word of God null and void in Yahshua's day. So that when you add the Masoretic Nikudot to these Hebrew characters, you end up with something that is just as confusing. Uh, language that is just as easy to manipulate, just as easy to say that it is such an obscure language. It's such a... Uh, I remember all the claims made to me about Hebrew when I was first understanding this Hebrew language underlying the so-called Old Testament. So many people told me, yeah, you know, that's the thing about Hebrew. You know, Hebrew can be such an abstract language. It's so open to interpretation. That's not true. That's utterly untrue. If anybody believes that the great and only true living wise and good God would have the bulk of his scriptures written in a language that was so open to interpretation without vowels that somebody could come along and then basically just uh, standardize all the vowels that they say existed in the way that it existed and thus malign and pervert his words so greatly. Well, I don't know if you even believe in that God. Because I don't believe that the God that is described to us in the scriptures is the God who would have them all written in a language so malleable. Now, I would think, after looking very quickly at this image here, and if you check the charts, and I'm going to have to get off this chart, I'm going to go back to a chart. And once I can get my arrows so that I can toggle through these charts, maybe I'm going to have to actually go back down to a smaller version of this table in order to get my arrows back so I can go back. Usually, it toggles for me, but I may have to reopen it because I can't see my arrows at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to be opening a chart that's called the Petrovic chart. Uh, again, Petrovic provides his own ideas of what the interpretation of these characters ought to be. Um, I don't trust Petrovic's interpretations any more than Benner's or just about anyone else out there giving interpretations. 
But the interesting thing about the Petrovic chart, which makes it very useful, is that he is going to provide to the right occurrences of that character and what archaeological find it was located at. Now this is very, very valuable because then we can see, like for instance, the first character, Sinai 377. That does bear a remarkable resemblance to other characters that we've seen. So, the only issue that I have with this character is the way it has already been stylized. I want to bring that to your attention. This character that you're seeing here to the very left, which is the typical character you're going to see when you start looking into the ancient Hebrew slash proto sinaitic It has been stylized. If you go back to the Petrovic chart and you look at its occurrences throughout different archaeological finds, you're going to see that in a number of ways it does not quite bear uh, the same characteristics per se as the extremely stylized fonts that we have now. We have a number of fonts now that show this character in this way. They have stylized it in a way that would make one think that <clears throat> this is representing uh, maybe an ox's head or a bull's head. And that's how you need to look at it, and that's the, that's what you should think of when you start contextualizing it with other characters. Now, I'm not convinced about this, because as I have looked at this character, along with the other characters in the Hebrew alphabet, as I have looked at this character, and considered the words that it's in and what those words represent. For instance, one of the first uh, word occurrences that we see it in that really leaves quite an impression, we do see it first in the Brashit part of Genesis 1.1. And the next word, Alaim, not Elohim. All of these pronunciations that you people may know, this ad hoc Hebrew, again, those are fiat pronunciations based on the Masoretics Nakud. But if we look directly at it, understanding that there were vowels in the first place, keeping everything consistent, we would extract from this Alaim. Alaim. Okay? Now, the, the parent root of Alaim is the A and L, or A and L. That A is this character right here. The L looks very much like a modern L, which we'll get to in time. Now, they would say things like the ox's head mixed with what they say the uh, L, or what's called the Lamed. They would say the combination of those two characters means a certain specific thing. Well, the more I look at the uh, so-called Aleph, A, A, when I look at it in context with many simple uh, two-character parent root words, it does tend to upset me a little bit that that's the definition given. Although it does work in a number of contexts that the gatekeepers are representing it in, I don't really think that's so much what we are to understand about it. And I'm going to show you why I believe what I believe. I believe that when we look at this character, the A, or so-called Aleph, 
what we should be seeing here, in my opinion, is more the horns which represent authority. Not that it's an ox's head so much, no, but these authoritative horns. And again, when you look at the Petrovic chart and track it, really more what sticks out than anything on this character is there is something below with horns. Something below with horns. Something below with horns. And thus far in my studies, I would have to conclude that the important feature we're noticing here is the horns. And I'm about to illustrate it right now. Exodus 34. If any of you would like to look at your own Bible, that's wonderful. I've got it up in the, uh, the Q Bible. Uh, they have a, a Hebrew Old Testament section where you can read the modern Jewish characters at the left. They will give you the <laughs> Masoretes uh, rules of pronunciation in the middle and then the King James at the right. So you're definitely, I mean, they're definitely setting you up to fail, but we've got an inside track and we're not going to fail. But we are going to have to look at pretty much everything that we're examining in their contexts. So we're going to start in Exodus 34, 29. Now before this, Yahweh had instructed Moshe to cut new tables of stone and bring them up to the mountain and not let any other man or beast near or on the mountain. He gave him a number of very specific instructions while he was up there. And then Moshe wrote his instructions down and he had the tables with the, I guess, Ten Commandments, which the more you look at these words, I promise you, the more you'll get upset with translators, and specifically the Masoretes. Moshe comes down from the mountain, and here we find him having come down in Exodus 34, 29, and I'm going to read just that verse. And you know, I just realized, as I was taking a break and thinking about this, I'm not going to be able to keep the given definitions by the gatekeepers from you because it actually, it actually is going to be important that you know what's being said currently about these characters. I am going to provide you with various websites of various peoples who in general I believe are one of a few things, either gatekeepers or dupes who are just pulling from the information of the gatekeepers, or oh, the other example I suppose would be uh, the modern academics who really just simply know a system that's actually, a, it is different than the ancient Hebrew gatekeepers. It's just the system of the Masoretes, and I believe there are some of them that uh, do attempt to teach that system, although they don't really grasp that the system that they're passing on to others is a system designed and implemented to cause confusion and lack of understanding. So that being said, Exodus 34.29. Now I just told you Moshe or Moshe was on the mountain with Yahweh. He had received his instructions again 
and he had cut two new tables, because the first tables were destroyed. Now, before I read this verse, and we talk about the specifically what's going on or being described here, you have to remember something. Before this incident occurred, there was a previous incident, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, where Masha went up on the mountain. He got the tablets of stone, which were written on by the finger of Yahweh himself. He stayed with Yahweh for some time, and when he came down, you'll remember that while he was up there, the children of Israel began to grumble against him, which they constantly did, even after they saw the greatness, the power, the unbelievable might of Yahweh in Egypt against the Egyptians and not them, they still so quickly would complain and grumble and do such wicked things. Now, he had been gone for a little while, a few weeks. And they went to Aaron, Aharon, his brother, and they gave to him a great amount of their gold, which he requested from them, and it says to make them an idol. It says that he made them a calf, but of course that could very easily be one of those words we don't fully understand yet. He made them essentially some kind of Elohim that was fashioned precisely what Yahweh tells Moshe here not to do in chapter 34. He's emphatic and he repeats it, tells him again, don't do this. That's what Aaron did. He fashioned them an Elohim out of gold, and he engraved on this, possibly at the base somehow, it would seem other various images, and wrote on it that this is the Elohim that delivered you from Egypt. I mean, you talk about insulting. And then they declared that the next day after he had fashioned this thing, which as he said to Moses, I just threw all the gold together and put it in the furnace and out popped this Elohim. <laughs> so once it was fashioned, they declared that the next day would be a celebration because they were looking at Yahweh Elohim the way that they looked at the Elohim of Egypt and they had him fashion one like unto them. The next day, they said it'll be a celebration, and what it seems like they did was that the whole great company of them, the next day, decided to participate in probably one of the typical Egyptian celebrations, which would have been full of loud music and partying and celebration and hedonism and possibly orgies as well. Because that's how pagans would celebrate their Elohim. And now I say all of this because as I said, I believe it's possible that the way that the Elohim that Aaron fashioned has been perhaps misdescribed as a calf. What we might want to more understand was that he fashioned some sort of Elohim that specifically would have had, as a great high sort of Elohim, the horns of power. Now, you look at ancient, and I really shouldn't say Egyptian, it's Mitzurim, it's Mitzurim. It's not Egypt, it's Mitzurim. You look at 
what we have, or what we've been told, is ancient Matsurim iconography, you will see with their great high leaders, or great high Elohim, the great large horns of power with invariably a sun disk between them. So I think what distinguished the great high Elohim, the false god, that they were worshipping was the horns. Now perhaps that's why it was translated as calf. I don't know yet, but what I do know is what we're about to talk about. He came down from the mountain the first time. He saw that Elohim idol that they were worshipping, calling Yahweh. And he was more than a little perturbed. More than a little perturbed. He was uh, outraged. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. Read the story of what he does with the Elohim. and Very interesting. Now, what I find to be even more interesting is when he goes up the second time, which is Exodus 34, and he spends that time with Yahweh. He doesn't eat the whole time. He is sustained by Yahweh's presence. And he gets these commandments again, the tables. And now this time, after he's been gone for a while, after what happened in the, the, the first time, He's sent back down by Yahweh. And it says in 3429, And it came to pass when Mashe came down from Mount Sini with the two tables of testimony in Mashe's hand. When he came down from the mount, that Mashe, and it says wist, but when you read it here, you would see that it says uh, we've got uh, Umashe, so and Moses, La, so that would be not the negative. Uh, Ido would be knowledge. Ki, um, was, and. Here we've got Quran, Quran, and then Aur, skin, Pani'u, of his face. <clears throat> what they're saying is that he didn't know that on the skin of his face were, now here in the King James, it says he didn't know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He didn't realize that while he was with Yahweh, that Yahweh had caused him to don the horns of power, of authority. Now, why would I say something like that Yahweh would have caused these authoritative horns to be protruding from his face? Now, I, I would doubt that we're talking about his face as far as his chin and his cheeks, it would probably have been the face as far as his forehead, his head, his face. Again, the King James and most other modern translation are going to say shone or shined or beamed, okay? Now, the word here is 7160. We look it up in Strong's, and we have this word, Quran. Okay? And they're going to give us a definition of to shine, or sub-definitions, the call to send out rays, or B, 
hifil to display or grow horns, to be horned. Now, in Strong's definition for Quran, a primitive root to push or gore, used only as denominative from 7161 to shoot out horns figuratively <laughs> raise figuratively raise they're making it up and I'll show you why they're making it up because the only place where it's translated as shown or raise is the three occurrences in Exodus 34 of this word. Now, funny enough, the fourth occurrence listed as Strong's H7160 happens to be horns. And you know why? Because in this instance, in Psalm 6931, they couldn't fudge it and make it shown because it says, This also shall please Yahweh better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. So they couldn't say, hath light rays and hoofs. They had to give it up. You know, their deceit is always found out the more you pick through it. I'm telling you, if you guys knew what I knew now after picking through Strong's and the Masoretic traditions and what has been handed down to us by our ancestors, you would be just livid. Shame on them kind of livid. But you know, most of the people who handed this stuff down to us were, after all, our enemies not our friends. And those people who go along with them without being suspicious of them and take this information and regurgitate it back to us are absolutely sleepy, sleepy, blind shepherds. Shame on them too. Now, the next listing in Strong's is H7161. It's the same word, but it has different Masoretic Nikud on it. And that's what's supposed to be the division. You'll see that as you go through the uh, occurrences of it, there's 76 occurrences. You've got horns, 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 horns. I'm just, I'm just... I'm just giving you the translate uh the translated listings here, okay? Horns, 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 horn, 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 horn. And if you look at it in context, you, you can tell that it does mean horn. Actually means horn. Like you would think of horn, like on um, you know, a number of various animals who have Horns, 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 horns. It's all horns. Horns, 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 horns. But, but, they want you to believe that in three of these four listings here that have a little different nakud on the word, it just means that, that it shined. It just means it was shiny. And the light beams were like horns. I've never seen light beams take the shape of horns. I've only ever seen horns that look like horns. He must have been quite a frightening sight. And I don't claim to entirely understand the reasonings for all of this. But I must wonder. And consider this when we want to decide who might be the most likely descendants of the tribes of Israel today and what we know of throughout history. Most other cultures, if you want to do an image search, 
look up the kings or tribal leaders of most cultures around the world. Most of them you will find wearing a headdress of some sort or another, whether it be an elaborate turban or whether it be a great feathered headdress or one displaying uh, iconography of serpents, suns, various uh, images and, well, plumage. <laughs> the one thing that you'll find distinct is that when you look through the leaders or kings of the Northern Europeans, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Celtic people, and their leaders, which at some point in time uh, did finally adapt the golden crown, which of course either bore the horns in the front or the horns all the way around, or in other cases, if we're talking more of Northmen and the um, close relatives of Northmen, then they quite simply wore the horns of power on their helmets. The horns were to indicate authority. So going back to the A, A, so-called Aleph, I think that what we really want to be paying attention to here is the horns of authority, more than whether or not it may be an ox or a bull or whatever else it may be. As a matter of fact, when you look at the various archaeological finds uh, that are known of, you'll see that why it could be a number of things here that are wearing the horns of authority. So, at this point, as I said, what I would appreciate is taking this information, consider what I've said, start utilizing what free tools that there are available, and start looking at this language, because this is the source language of all the knowledge that we are aware of passed down to us from our great God. So I think it's important enough to start getting familiar with. Now, not everybody is going to have uh, a knack for or a gift for understanding languages. I get it. But I am fully confident in making these videos that our Father is going to send a person or peoples along to, to see these, and they are going to have a gift of languages, and they are going to uh, glean far more out of this than I am yet able, and they're going to have the spirit of love in their hearts from the Father, to give this information back out freely. And that's exactly why I'm doing it. So, for now, there is the A. A, so-called Aleph. We'll be using it more as we go along. But for right now, I don't want to illustrate it in too many words, because I find that that is another key feature of the gatekeepers. Um, they 
seem to uh, quickly want to form a, a construct of these things so that they can get your mind trapped in their web of lies when everybody thinks that they have escaped the Masoretic web of lies then if they're not careful they just end up trapped in the gatekeepers webs of lies so until next time any and everything that you're able to get out of this give it back to others because that is a show of love for your God, your Savior, and his people. So take care.